Okay, so let's introduce this new pattern that I've come up with. This was created on a 96 slot cylinder and I used the five cylinder needles, one empty slot mock rib pattern all the way around. And I created this with cotton and 100 rows. And the idea of this is to close one end of the tube with Kitchener, which I prefer to do on the inside, and then finish the live stitches of the other side of the tube with a darning needle, very easy. And so the result is a tube that you can use like a washcloth, it's cotton, but also as a way to wash your face. You can use the back. I find this is an ideal way to wash one's face if one wants to use a cotton cloth because you know where the soap is, you know where the water is, and it's just very easy to use. If you have any mobility issues, it just fits right over your hand very easily. And if this isn't the way you'd like to use it, this is an extra option, you can certainly fold it over Fold it over and use it like this, like a regular cloth on any of those surfaces. Uh, you can hang it up to dry. You can put a bar of soap on the inside and use it this way and simply leave the bar of soap in there. And I've done this before where I put soap in a a pouch of some sort and at one point or another you want to have access to it so even just leaving it open is, is perfectly fine. If you choose to use this as a pouch that holds soap so that it suds nicely you can then use if you apply um, identification tag like I do and it's a loop you can hang it up so it can dry that way as well. So this is a multifunctional approach and able to be used on any cylinder. So whether your cylinder has only 60 stitches or 60 cylinder needles, or whether it has much more, if you utilize it uh, in this very basic pattern uh, using a mock rib that you prefer, you can certainly add a nice detail to the fabric itself. So as you can see here, I've made quite a few. Uh, the loop itself is a Amazon eBay purchased type of stretchy elastic that's usually used for masks. Inside, I've just knotted a loop and I've singed the edges so they don't fray. That's a double knot on the inside and a single knot on the outside so nothing moves. In terms of adding your own identity to a product like this, one example is to have ribbon labels printed. This is a fabric that washes well and of course has your identification on it, which means in the future if someone sees it and likes it, they can get that information and contact you for one. So here we go. That's what this is. I love these. I know the idea is very basic. It's just simply a tube that's closed and open. But with the right fiber, this makes this a wonderful gift, especially for Christmas. I just love that idea. Using a really nice cotton can really make the utility use of this quite easy. I have... Um, purchased this fiber from Hobby, H-O-B-B-I, and they have a wonderful eight slash four cotton on a huge cone. And it makes these wonderful examples. They're really nice. You could use these as dishcloths if you wish, but I found this type of cotton is quite nice even on your face. It's nice, soft, and it, it, it does the job well, actually. Um, these are some samples that I created as well. Now these, these ones here, 
they actually aren't in cotton, they are in acrylic. And if one wanted to do that, you could simply use it as a non-absorbent fiber cleaning cloth or some other purpose, but this actually is cotton. I have a lot of vintage, beautiful cotton fibers that are quite absorbent and soft, and uh, they would make a wonderful gift if finished just nicely. the actual tube as it comes off the machine by a purple scrap and the length of um, the project yarn, usually about as long as my arm. Uh, then I work the 100 rows in a pattern I thought I'd prefer, which is the five in one. And then I had a, a long as my arm in it ending of the project yarn and then the scrap. I like to put about 15 rows between my projects so that I can easily cut down the middle when I'm watching my yarn tails so I don't cut them by accident and easily separate them and have them not fall apart if I'm just taking up a project one at a time. Okay, welcome to this quick tutorial on basically how I close the toes of my sock knitting machine sock. Yeah, that made sense. All right, so what you see is all you need here for this. Um, in addition, the stitches I have um, had on the machine, I'll show which ones those are. I have four stitch markers in use here, it's two on each side. So this is what the sock basically looks like. It doesn't matter what this part looks like for you. What for you at this point is how to close this part here. So my rule of thumb when it comes to working on the sock knitting machine is to use a similar fiber as scrap whenever it touches the sock yarn so that the tension's the same. If, these, if this material here was super thin thread, you'd really just be working with a nightmare, just trust me. Um, all right, so let's, what I like to do is I like to turn my sock inside out to start. So let's do that first. Looking at your sock, you will see, if you've done what I've done, um, you have on the machine, you finished your sock, you um, added the scrap yarn, and as a good tip, add your, um, sock markers or your stitch markers actually on the first row the first stitch on the top and the 
bottom one, the first stitch down here too. So both first stitches are marked on the right at the beginning of the corner and the same thing over here on this side. By marking them, there's less likely that you'll forget them, that they'll get pulled in and you won't see them and forget to secure them. All right, so you've got those there and you've got those there. Um, for every sock that I do, the last row I do, I always make sure before I work the toe that I've switched the stitches back to regular cylinder needles. So I don't know if you can tell there that I have in this example, I actually have a ribbed sock. So this is using the ribber, um, which looks different than mock rib. Mock rib is just the space, a uh, row of unknitted knit stitches with just bars, where this is actually a row of of um, on this side it appears as knitting but right down here at the corner these are all just regular knit stitches on this side you see the pearls so all you see here are pearl stitches basically the point there being is this last row or first row depending on how you look at it where you can see the light blue this is all the same orientation stitch which is what we're looking for Whenever you do kitchenering, if you want an even result, you want to have a, an even approach. And that means doing the same kind of stitches all the way across. So this will make more sense as we go. Um, honestly, this once you set yourself up um, in the beginning of closing the toe, the rest of it's super monotonous and very easy to do. So this sock is a 72 cylinder created sock. Um, so there's a, quite a few stitches I need to close, but not too many. So thread your needle with your sock yarn. You'll see that the tail, uh, when I finished it, it came off the sock here. I can see that there. Make sure that these stitches aren't too big, that they've been kind of snugged up good. So because we are on the corner, the corners always have a certain approach. This is how I do it. Uh, each corner is going to have almost like an elbow or an intersection kind of stitch. Basically, if you looked at that there, it might be a little bit hard to see. There's one bar right here, right there. And it's kind of in the, the apex of the, um, the corner. So what I want to do is snug up my top row of stitches there just so it's nothing too loose and funky um, the path that we're going to take with our needle is in that elbow stitches I'm going to call it or intersection it's our first pass and now that we're on the bottom let's just reorient orientate keep it horizontal let's take off the stitch marker now that we have it Okay, so the trick here is what is up goes up, what is down goes down. So by keeping this, these two rows kind of um, train track like, where you have this top row and then you have this bottom row and they're kind of parallel, it does make it a bit easier for you, okay? So we're in that corner intersection. Now we're going to orient from down up. So the first thing we do is we capture the first stitch on the bottom now we want to go back to that elbow stitch. There we go. And just pull up. Now try not to over tighten this. There we go, just like that. And now that from the top, we want to capture that first row of stitches from the top down. And so, what we do now is for each time that we make a pass, we pass with two stitches. So we're on the top, we're gonna go back, diagonally up to that first row, there we are, and then go down. So this is the needle pattern that we're gonna continue to do throughout. Let's take off that first top stitch marker, snug it up a bit, it's a bit loose. Ensure that you're holding your two rows of stitches. All right, there we go. So now we all we do is this continuous pattern. So go to the neighbor on the bottom, go to the prior diagonal, and go up. Go to the neighbor on the top, 
go to the diagonal on the bottom, go through. And just we're repeating that.
All right, as we come to the almost the end of our joining or our kitchenering, we make sure that we when we end the procedure of what we're doing is we do what we did when we started. So that all sounds really complex, but it really isn't. So continue on over until you get to your stitch markers. If you were to Kitchener without joining that kind of corner intersection or elbow as I call it, stitch, then you're gonna find that it kind of creates a squarish kind of point without kind of um, emerging of the stitches. So do try to make sure that when you first start and when you end, you always include the corner of um, that stitch, which will make more sense again in a minute when we get to this side. And by including it, you kind of just weave the ends in, which is quite nice. All right, so we are down to the last two stitches, which are great that we can see them because they're marked. If you hadn't marked it, that's fine, but what happens is sometimes these, these last stitches can be hidden because this stitch marker is actually holding them in place. Um, and if they uh, were just left there with the scrap holding them, they might have just by tension kind of been sucked in and you wouldn't see them and miss them. And then when you remove the scrap, it would come undone. So the bottom run, bottom stitch we know horizontally, we come on over. And as we continue on with our regular pattern, first we take off that bottom stitch marker. We no longer need it and start with our, continue with our pattern, diagonal up there. And again, coming back down, we grab that stitch marker off and same pattern, diagonal. All right, so now the last step then is to do that elbow stitch again, which is right there. Otherwise, you see there's a hole there and it wouldn't kind of merge nicely together. So we'll go down. We're on the down, so we come back up. We wanna aim for that last top stitch diagonal just in our same pattern. There you go. And then what I choose to do from here is I generally just like to kind of come back to the side here. Maybe even, you know, do whatever you want here. This is pretty much fair game. All right, good. So at this point, what I'll do is I'll remove the scrap yarn and my needle so I don't drop it, because it does that. Turn it back inside out. So this is what you've got now. You've got this trapped sock scrap. Scrap weight sock, lots of words there. So um, basically, all I like to do is, uh, being cautious, I just remove one of the scrap yarn um, legs, so to speak, making sure not to cut your sock yarn. And I will pull on it and it'll come undone. Some people use um, a cord that you pull on. They refer to that cord as ravel cord just to make it an easy removal. Um, and that's certainly one approach. I personally don't choose to use a cord that I can easily pull out that's special for that just because I find it's often not the same tension as the sock yarn. And I, I, I would rather not kind of change the tension of the needles. I want everything to match and be easy. So there we go, I've cut a couple times all the way around. I like to be extra cautious here. I mean, you can be as MacGyver, as Houdini as you wish, but I like to just do things in small increments to make sure I'm not pulling on the wrong things. So here is now this tail I can pull on, which I've just easily done. Now all those stitches are undone, which is quite nice. Uh, because this darker green that you're seeing here is a old sock yarn, it's, it's quite durable. I can pull on it quite good and remove a bunch. Um, I don't know if you saw that, when I was uh, kitchenering, I caught the scrap, so I split it, and that's why you, it's better to do this slowly, because if you've caught it again, like here, you don't want to challenge your sock yarn. You just want to release the scrap. If that makes any sense. Best to be extra cautious, in my opinion. All right, so here we go. Let's pull the next little zip tie. 
all right and it'll be all tight and if you find one side is a bit too tight you can just proceed to another section let's see here it's a bit convoluted let's go to the other side all right using your needle helps kind of just undo specific area of stitches just to make it easier to remove I don't know about you, my fingers are not that small. There we are. So identify the first row, which is this one here. Pull on it. If we identify the second row and pull on it, it won't remove it from the sock and it'll just tighten everything. So again, locate first row, pull on it. There you are, that was successful quite a bit. Right, and just do whatever it takes to take off that scrap. I use often use a scrap yarn that's an acrylic of equal weight. Of course, you know, this is way easy off camera because it behaves. Once it's on camera, man, this stuff acts up so much. Okay, yeah. So this is how challenging one will be but I almost never have this much issue with <laughs> removing scrap but always on camera all right there'll be a point where the first row it'll seem you pull on it and it's actually the second row so just like that was the second row when I pulled on it just got tighter it didn't didn't undo it the camera like crazy. Go. So I don't expect you'll have this miss issues. Sometimes it just does what it wants. And I must have divided the sock yarn a couple times with the needle when I went through it. So it's all my fault, don't worry. There we go. Perfect. All right, let's move our mess. So when we are done on the toe side of the sock, you're gonna see no seam. When you run your fingers over it, it's smooth, smooth. Now the true shape of your sock you're, won't be known until after you wash it. When the stitches say, okay, fine, I will sit here just fine, don't worry. All right, and then when you look at your sock here, there's no seam. It feels really nice, it'll feel really great it'll get your against your, your toe. So all we have to do now is manage the tail, make sure it won't undo. I like to go like five stitches. Um, I like to also just kind of stay towards the closer part of the seam, just trying to reduce any extra bumps and lumps in the sock for when it's in your shoe. So just basically trap the yarn tail. I like to go at least five, five stitches because you certainly don't want anything to undo when it's in the wash. And so that would be wrong. And more work. Who wants more work? All right, so you can go five minimum. You can do what works for you. I'm just gonna do with what I feel. What a lot of, and always harder on camera. Maybe a couple more. Ba, ba, ba. All right, so that's it. Pull a little bit, cut, it'll sit back under a stitch. That's it. All right, so today's segment or this segment here 
This segment is about finishing your work after you've taken it off the machine and you've finished with some scrap. I call this, um, this process single pass off machine bind off. I realized just now that while I have posted on Flickr and posted on the Facebook groups and even Instagram, um, I have not made a video. So perhaps let's do that now. It's actually straightforward, super easy. And then I can make this one segment two purposes. One, I'll, I'll post it separately uh, for just that procedure method to take it off the machine and finish it. And I'll also add it to the project I'm currently working on just for how to finish that project. All right, so just a quick introduction. When you're looking at uh, your finished results after doing this procedure, you will find it's quite beautiful, very stretchy, and you almost don't realize that it is done this way. And it's very, very easy. So when I look here, for example, when you see these two things, this is the top and the bottom of the flat universal um, cast on bonnet with split rings. When you look at that, you can see if you look real close, this was the hung hem, so that's why it's so extra gorgeous. And this is the single pass off machine bind off. That's at least what I call it. Perhaps somebody out there has the, another name for it, but this is the name I do, I have. So when I'm looking at that, this is it here. I can stretch it. It doesn't have any problems. It It's perfect. The purpose of this, of course, is just to secure the, excuse me, the live stitch to the row that it lines up to. Excuse me. So for example, when we look at another item, so this same version of that project, I started it um, from the bottom and I worked Rather, I started it from the top, which didn't have anything done to it special, and I worked down to the bottom. When I got to the bottom, I'll turn it around, I did the same bind off, the single pass off machine bind off. And it looks quite impressive, actually. It's very stretchy, it's flat, it's, it's super easy. So anyways, this is the wrong side or pearl side, and this is the knit side or good side. So, you know, easy, beautiful, why not? So let's continue. Um, I've just done the project uh, how-to video for, <coughs> excuse me, the flat universal um, split ring cast on bonnet. And I'm at the very bottom of the project. So we, we work the top. I'm on the inside, of course. There is my hung hem. That's what it looks like. It's a little bit loose right now. And I work down the machine, and I'm holding it in reverse because I'm, I'm actually going to work on this corner. And what I've all I've done is I finished the machine, the live stitches, with some scrap yarn. And for clarity, I've used a scrap that's very, very different than my working yarn. And so what I want to do here. For simplicity and clarity, I've made sure that my scrap is one color, my sock machine sock yarn is that color, and it's just easy to see where all the borders of everything is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the stitch I have here, this point, and I'm going to connect it to the one down here that mirrors it in alignment. Um, this is a little easier if you iron it first so you have a little more definition when you're working. But I find that this particular reinforcement fiber that I'm using actually um, tends to curl regardless. So if I secure it and then iron it, it'll probably be happier. happier. So all you have to do is just as the name of it sounds, it's a single pass off machine bind off. So thread yourself a darning needle. These are a three pack at Walmart and wonderful because they're very flexible to and easy to thread regardless of your yarn thickness. And you want to take the, the working live stitch that's there and keep in mind it's actually the top part. This one that's up here. It'll be this top row that you see at the very top. It's not this little one here, it's this top row. 
So I want to actually kind of go through that loop. Because if I pulled on it and there was no sock yarn, no scrap there, it would come undone. So I'm just going to just trap it first, hold it with my thumb. And now that we've trapped it, once you get started, it's easy, kind of like Kitchener, unless you find Kitchener very difficult. But I think once you get it, you get it. And you're like, why didn't I get it? But anyways, so we want to line up to the furthest yellow bar and that just secures it. It's super easy. So now that we've done the first pass, what I like to do is I just go to the next one. There we are. And it's gonna fold over like a cuff. Don't pull it too tight, but don't leave it too loose. Like Goldilocks said, just right. So we have there, and then the next bar. Hopefully it's straightforward and easy to see. Having good light makes a huge difference. And so the furthest yellow bar here, the topmost yellow bar there, straightforward. So we'll do that a couple more and then I'll put the video on pause and continue so if you drop any of these somehow while you're working or miss one put it down go to the bathroom come back oh where was I oh, I'll just do it and you undo the scrap and things undo don't worry stop immediately get your darning needle out and same yarn and just sew it together no one has to know I won't tell if you won't all right, so there we are. You get the premise. Basically, the parallel sets like a train track. Just capture them with a single pass. Now, you can make this fancy. You could do double passes. You can go diagonal. You could do all kinds of stuff. But why? You don't need to. So then we'll line up this next one with this one on top. And we'll continue. So I'm going to pause the video here to go further faster for you. Okay, so I have gone all the way over with that. And I have kind of ended there. I'll show you in a minute when I steam it because this is what it looks like now. Okay, so this is what the final result looks like. I have quickly steamed it with my iron. Now, at quick glance, it certainly doesn't look like it would be long enough, but it was, it is, it will be. And that's what that looks like. So let's zoom in. So this, of course, is the hung hem. That's what it looks like. And this is the single pass off machine bind off. And that's what we can expect it to look like. So thank you for watching today. My name is Karen Rommel and here I am paying it forward. Share your knowledge with someone else and help them when you can. Thank you.